I don't know about you, but I needed that, just a time of praise and worship here this morning. I just thank our praise team for providing that for us and for the Lord being here in our midst. Uh, boy, it is uh, just something powerful and supernatural about a group of believers gathering together, worshiping together, and the Lord coming into our midst uh, with us. Now, as you're well aware of by now, we are in the great faith chapter of the Bible, Hebrews uh, chapter 11. And we've been looking at some of the great heroes of the faith. And last week, our study brought us to Abraham, the father of the nation of Israel. And we learned that not only is he the physical father of the nation of Israel, but he is the spiritual father of all who, who believe. If you're a believer this morning, your faith can be traced back to Abraham. This is where it all began. Now, we learned last week what separates Abraham's faith from all of his predecessors is that he was the first individual who lived an entire life marked by faith. Prior to Abraham's existence, we see acts of faith by different individuals within the Scriptures. But Abraham went beyond these singular acts of faith to living an entire uh, life of faith. Faith in God. And faith in God's promises was the driving force behind everything that Abraham did. The Bible tells us that he wholeheartedly believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Abraham was righteous in the eyes of God because of one thing, his faith. And that's how we too become righteous in the eyes of God. Nothing other than faith. And here in the 11th chapter, the Holy Spirit is revealing to us through Abraham the hallmarks of a life lived by faith. And last week we saw the first three features that distinguish a life lived by faith from all the rest. We saw that a life of faith begins with a willingness to abandon the old for something new. When God called Abraham to a new life, he willingly left his country. He willingly left his family and friends, his old way of life, for something completely new. And that's what God is asking of each one of us here today. He's asking us to abandon our old way of life in order to follow him. That's what Jesus demanded from each of his disciples. He said, in order to follow me, you must abandon your old way of life and put me first. And that's a price that most aren't willing to pay. But that's where genuine faith always begins. We see it in Abraham, and we see it in every true believer down through the, through the ages. They forsake their old way of life for something new. Secondly, we saw that a life of faith perseveres despite the circumstances. We learned that for Abraham, this new life in the promised land was hard. Nothing was familiar. Life was uncertain. Things were constantly changing. He, he lived from tent to tent, feeling as if he was a stranger in a foreign land. But despite everything that he faced, Abraham persevered. And that's what genuine faith always does. It perseveres despite the circumstances. It always perseveres. It always perseveres. And finally, we saw last week that a life of faith provides the platform for the impossible to happen. When we provide the faith, God provides the impossible. You always find the impossible happening in a life lived by faith. For Abraham and Sarah, God provided a son when it was not possible from a physiological standpoint. It was impossible for them to, to have a child at their old age, but it happened. And it happened because of their faith. And when Isaac was born, so was a nation. The impossible being made possible through faith. Now today we're going to conclude this section on Abraham. And in these verses, we're going to see three more features of a life lived by faith. Now in order to refresh our memories and, and keep everything within its proper context, we're going to go back and we're going to begin reading in verse 8. Look at what we're told. We're told by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing where he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, 
dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of, the, of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims here on earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from where they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly country. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you today, and we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to gather in your house with your people. And Father God, I just pray, Lord, that you would just uh, take control of the room, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, uh, Lord, that you would just wash over us with your presence. Father God, I pray that you would just hide me behind your cross, Lord, that uh, my failures, my sin would not come in the way between you and your people. Lord, that they would hear your word loud and clear here this morning. Lord, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now, the fourth characteristic of a life lived by faith is that it will embrace God's promises to the very end. It will embrace God's promises to the very end. Look closely at what we're told in verse 13. We're told these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So here we're told that Abraham, Sarah, even Isaac and Jacob not only chose to live their lives by faith, but they ultimately died in faith. They held on to God's promises to the very end. And oftentimes, as we well know, the end comes before God's promises are ultimately fulfilled. In fact, we're told here in our text that when Abraham died, he had not yet received all the promises that God had declared. Sure, he had made it to the country God had promised, the promised land. He had even walked through that country side by side with Isaac, the promised son. But he never saw his descendants grow into this great nation that God had promised way back in Genesis chapter 12. Neither did he see the Messiah rise out of that nation and bless the entire world by the sacrifice made on Calvary's hill. But despite not seeing those promises fulfilled, Abraham still believed. He still believed that God's promises would eventually come to pass. Maybe not during his physical time here on earth. But he, but he believed that God would remain true to his word. Even in death, Abraham believed. But how? How did he do it? How did, how did his faith hold true even in those last days? Even when all of God's promises had yet to be fulfilled? How did it hold true? Well, faith has an amazing ability to do a number of things even in the midst of death even in the midst of death. And I've seen it time and time again with the saints here at the church that we've lost over the last few years. I saw it with Linda. I saw it with Tish. I saw it with Brad's sister, Angie. I saw it with Rita. The list goes on and on. 
Something amazing happened in there in the face of death. First, their faith held true because their faith was focused on the promises of God. They stayed focused on the promises of God, even despite death. We're told here in verse 13 of our text that Abraham saw God's promises afar off. Faith always has a way of looking past the present situation, looking past the present sufferings into the future and the promises that await. And that's what Abraham did even in the midst of death. He stayed focused on the future promises of God. And not only was he focused on those promises, but we're told here in our text that he embraced those promises. That word embrace literally means to joyfully receive. Abraham joyfully received the promises of God. In death, not only was he focused on God's promises, but he joyfully embraced those promises. There was joy even in the midst of death. Even in the midst of death. And Jesus testifies to that truth in John chapter 8, verse 56. He tells the Jews, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Jesus says, Abraham looked into the future, to the day of my coming, and even in death he rejoiced over the promise of my arrival. He embraced it. And not only that, but he accepted the fact that he was nothing more than a stranger in a foreign land. We're told at the end of verse 13 that he confessed that he was nothing more than a pilgrim here on earth. He accepted the fact that this earth wasn't his, his real home. And I see that same characteristics, those same characteristics time and time again in the saints who die in the faith. Those same three characteristics. There's a stark difference between someone who is dying in the faith and someone who is not. For the, for the saint, faith prevails even in the midst of death. And it's an amazing thing to watch. It is an amazing thing to watch. It's incredible to experience, as, as, as crazy as that sounds. But it is an amazing thing to watch. A life of faith ultimately ends in faith. It ends in faith. The Lord says in Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 40 that I will make an everlasting covenant with them and I will not turn away from them to do them good but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Faith never departs from God even in the midst of death. It sees it to the end. That's the reason the Bible says in Psalms 116 verse 15 precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. Precious is the death of one of his saints. So faith embraces God's promises to the very end. Fifthly, faith walks with purpose. It walks with purpose. Last week we saw that a life of faith begins when we willingly abandon the old way of life for something new. And that truth manifested itself in the life of Abraham when he left that old country behind in order to possess a new and better country. And that's what we're doing today when we abandon our old way of life for something new. We are leaving behind the old for something better. And right now, as believers, we are in effect in between two countries. We've left that old country behind. We've left our, our past behind, that old way of life. And now we're on a journey to a new and better country, aren't we? We're on a journey. And this road that we're on, we are on must be walked with diligence. It must be walked with intention, with purpose. And walking with purpose this morning requires two things. If you're going to walk this life with purpose, it's going to take two things. First, walking with purpose requires you to forget your past. It requires you to forget your past. You've got to forget your past mistakes. You've got to forget your past failures, your past sin, your past life. You've got to forget it all. And I know that's hard. I've been there. When my past just continually defined me. But look at what we're told in verses 14 and 15. We're told that Abraham was seeking a new country. But if he had been thinking of the land from which he came out, he would have had the opportunity 
to return. Think about what the Holy Spirit is revealing to us here. Abraham didn't dwell upon his past. Because if he did, the Bible says he would have found opportunity. He would have found reasons to return to that old land. To return to that old way of life. And that's a principle we've got to understand this morning. See, the more we think about our past, the more tempted we are to turn back to our old way of life when this walk gets hard. And this walk is hard. The Christian walk isn't for the faint of heart this morning. It takes a real man, a real woman, to stand up and follow Christ in the day in which we live. It takes a person who has a little bit of fortitude, a person that's got a little bit of backbone, a person who refuses to give in despite the pressures of this world. See, our inclination as people is to turn back when trials and tribulations arise. We want to turn back when we begin to suffer a little bit of hardship and affliction from this walk that we're on. Isn't that what the nation of Israel wanted to do when things got tough in the wilderness? They wanted to turn back. Things got a little bit hard. They started thinking about their past life in Egypt and they, they wanted to return. They never thought following God would be this hard. Who would have thought it? But understand this morning, church, there are no blessings to be found in turning back. No blessings to be found in turning back. You'll only find blessings in moving forward. You'll never walk this life with purpose until you stop looking back. You'll just drift along, teeter-tottering on something you think is faith. Or at least that's what you're calling it. Secondly, in order to walk this life with purpose, you must commit yourself to the future. You must commit yourself to what, what lies ahead. We're told at the beginning of verse 16 that Abraham desired a better country. That was his heart's desire. And that desire manifested itself in his commitment to pursue that new country at all costs. To pursue what the future held. He was committed. A life of faith is committed to God. It is committed to His Word and it is committed to His work. Those three things. It's committed to something better than what this world can offer. So it just moves forward. Totally committed. Totally sold out. For the hope of something better. Abraham was committed to God's promises of a better country. He forgot the past. He forgot all those things that were behind him. And he committed himself to the future. And isn't that what the great apostle Paul did as well? Listen to, the words and, listen to his words in Philippians chapter 3 verse 13. And many of you need to take note. Here's the secret to life. He says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing I do, Paul says, this is the one thing I do. This is the secret to my walk. I forget those things which are behind. I forget the past. And I strain forward to those things that lie ahead. Faith walks with purpose. And did you know that God honors those who faithfully walk in this manner? We're told in verse 16 that God is not ashamed to be called Abraham's God. And he's not ashamed to be called your God this morning. If you've put your faith in him. God's not ashamed of you this morning, church. Let that truth wash over you here today. God's not ashamed of you. If you've put your faith in him. Most of us walk around so ashamed of our past that we can't look up, much less look forward. But if you've repented of your sin, and if you've turned away from that old way of life, he's not ashamed of you. He's willing and happy. Willing and happy to be called your God because of your faith. Because of your faith. And we're told at the end of verse 16 that this truth is proven by the fact that he has prepared for you a city. God has prepared for you a city just to prove that he's not ashamed of you. Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in me, believe also in, uh, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. 
If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Hold on to that promise. Jesus has prepared a city for all those who faithfully walk with purpose, for all those who live by faith. And finally this morning, a life of faith is confirmed through trials. It's confirmed through trials. We're told in verse 17 that by faith Abraham, when he was tried, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your descendants be named. Now all of us here are familiar with the account of God testing Abraham. But listen again to what we're told in Genesis chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. We're told, and it came to pass after these things that God did test Abraham. Now what's God testing? God's testing Abraham's faith to see what his faith is truly made of. That's what tests do. They reveal the nature of our faith. They reveal where we really stand. And the Lord said unto Abraham, or said unto him, Abraham. And Abraham said, Behold, here I am. And the Lord said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell you. Now think about that. Put yourself in Abraham's shoes this morning. Here's Abraham, who's forsaken everything to follow God. I mean everything. Forsaken it all to follow God. He's left everything behind. And now he's being asked to do something that is completely outrageous. Offer up his son as a sacrifice. The very one that God had promised and provided. Now as a parent, that's unthinkable. It's unimaginable. That God would ask that of anyone, parent or not. And furthermore, from Abraham's perspective, if Isaac dies, so does the promise of this great nation. The nation of Israel dies with him. Okay? So this makes no sense on every level. So what do you think Abraham was thinking after that? What was he thinking when he rose up early that next morning and saddled up his donkey? What was he thinking there in the cool of the morning as he gathered wood? for that sacrifice God had asked him to make. What was he thinking as he watched Isaac sleep? What was he thinking when he gently woke him up? What was going through his mind as he journeyed those three days to Mount Moriah? And think about that. What was he thinking when he laid out that wood and then bound Isaac to the altar? What was he thinking when he rose that knife up? Was he questioning the goodness and wisdom of God as so many question it when they read this account? Was he thinking to himself, God has deceived me. God has lied to me. God cannot be trusted. Was he thinking, thinking to himself, this isn't fair? How could God do this to me after everything that I've done for him? After the sacrifices that I've made? Well, the Bible reveals to us here this morning exactly what Abraham was thinking over the course of those three days. And it wasn't any of those things that I just mentioned. Look at what we're told in verse 19. 
We're told that through it all, through it all, Abraham believed that God was able to raise Isaac from the dead. That's what Abraham was thinking. He believed the promises of God so much that even if he had to kill his only begotten son, God would bring him back to life just to fulfill his word, just to fulfill his promises. Now that's faith. That's believing the promises of God, isn't it? That's faith. Abraham believed in the resurrection power of God before anyone else. Before anyone else. This test revealed the true nature of Abraham's faith. And that's what tests do. They prove the authenticity of what you're claiming. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, you are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness. And are we not in heaviness as, as people, as a country, as a nation? Through the manifold trials and temptations of this life. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found to the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ Jesus. If you live this life by faith, you will be tested. You will be tested. There is no way around that truth. I look across this congregation and I see a people group who have been tested. Some of you in unimaginable ways. Some of you are being tested right now to see where you really stand. <laughs> to see where you really stand. But understand this, even in the midst of these tests and trials and, and tribulations, God's promises always hold true. They always hold true. And when you demonstrate faith in the face of adversity, you bring praise and honor and glory to none other than Christ Jesus. And that's the reason we exist, to bring glory to God. This is a life of faith. This is what you'll find in every life of faith. You'll find someone who has willingly abandoned the old for something new. You'll find someone who will persevere despite the circumstances. Despite what life throws at them, they'll persevere. You'll, you'll, you'll find miracles being performed in a life of faith. The impossible happening. You'll see that a, a life of faith will embrace God's promises to the very end. They'll never fall away. Because if they fall away, they were never with us to begin with, the Bible says. A life of faith walks with purpose. It walks with purpose. It forgets the past and it looks to the future. Look to the future. And a life of faith shines the brightest when it is tested. And I pray, church, that we shine brightly as the world is being tested in our day and time. Let us be that city on the hill, church, pushing back the darkness, shining the light. You cannot push back darkness with darkness. Only light will push back the darkness. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you today, and Lord, we just thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that it is the desire of every individual here to live a life marked by faith. And Lord, we know that we can't live this life apart from your presence, apart from the Holy Spirit indwelling us and empowering us. And Lord, I pray that that's what takes place. Lives live by faith. And Father God, when our faith is waning and wavering, Lord, prop us up and help us stand. Help us believe. Lord, perform the impossible in our lives. Father God, we just thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for our time of worship. And Father God, we just pray that people have been encouraged and challenged. Lord, we know that your 
word doesn't return void. And we pray that it does a great work here within our hearts, within the room. Lord, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to ask everyone to stand.